uh, just a couple of quick notes. There uh, now is advice for the pilot study on the website. So we're saying write up this hypothesis and pilot study. And Hogger pointed out, you know, Matt, it would be really nice if you like gave some suggestions or included some details. That would be really useful. So we, we've added that. Um, hopefully you find it uh, useful, but please do uh, feel free to use Discord or email any questions that come up. Exercise two should be up very quickly. And now what I'm going to do is uh, turn it over to the video. The volume may be a little loud, so watch out for that. But first, I'll just mention that I worked with Brad at UT Austin. He was one of the people that actually got me interested in human in the loop machine learning. After he graduated with his PhD in UT, he went to MIT for a postdoc. Then he did a startup, which he, I believe he co-founded. And now he's leading a research group at Bosch, focusing on RL for autonomous driving. Um, I'll also point out that on his webpage, you can see his absurdly long list of awards, including my favorite is the AI 10 to watch by IEEE. So what I'm gonna suggest now is I'm gonna go hop into this uh, video, and then you can start asking questions on Discord Brad and I may answer some of them there, but then after the video, we can talk. We can uh, uh, stop showing the video and then talk more about them. So, in the interest of time, I'm going to hop right into this. Hi, I'm Brad Knox, and I'm going to talk about a framework called Tamer that learns control from explicit human feedback, and specifically an implementation of Tamer on a robot. Uh, this work was all done jointly with Peter Stone, and the robotic portion is, is also, uh, Cynthia Brazil was also a collaborator. First, I'm going to talk about the Tamer system, just introduce it briefly and give, give an overview. And then I'm going to talk about that implementation on the robot Nexi. But first, let me talk about the overarching research goal here. Uh, and that's that we want to empower users who may not have technical training to customize and teach new behavior. The number of applications is, is vast for this, this broad uh, problem. Uh, it includes uh, things like having assistive robots, training video game characters, and also working on an assembly line with, with robots and, and needing to, to customize their behavior. There are a number of different ways that robots can learn from human teachers. I'm only going to talk about the first one here, learning from scalar feedback, but there's also learning from demonstration, often called imitation learning, and going by specific forms of behavior cloning or inverse reinforcement learning, learning from advice, uh, and, and, and so on. There's some others as well. First, let me give a somewhat of a hand-wavy definition of human feedback. The hand-waviness, I think, is somewhat necessary because we are talking about uh, something with a human element. And so the hand wavy part is about what the humans are actually, what their mental model is and what, what, what it means when they give this feedback. Uh, but we mean uh, communications of approval, disapproval, reward, punishment, something in that kind of sphere of ideas of positive and negative uh, feedback signals that can be intuitively mapped to a numeric signal for the evaluation of agent behavior. So I don't mean advice and I don't mean demonstration. I just want to be clear about that. Uh, I'll also briefly note, uh, I used to call this human reward. Uh, that specific terminology didn't catch on and I might accidentally refer to it as that. And uh, I think at least one diagram has it written as that. To give a sense of, of what this uh, learning from explicit human feedback or from human feedback looks like, here's a Tetris agent uh, acting randomly, just randomly choosing piece placements. Uh, and here's a training session where after a placement, the black box at the top left will flash red when a negative one uh, feedback is given and a green for a positive one. And feedback can be given from the time of the placement to the time of the next piece's placement. And if a button is pushed, so if, uh, if a button is pushed multiple times, that's a stronger amount of feedback. So the label for a placement, uh, if I push the positive button twice, two green flashes would be positive two. If I push the negative button once for a placement, then the, the label would be negative one. Um, so that's what the interface looks like. And you should be able to tell it's already doing better than random. Not fantastic, but better than random. 
And here's after two games of training by an expert trainer. Uh, in our in our actual experiments, we don't have expert trainers, and they are also uh, more often than not able to train uh, behavior that at least qualitatively meets the, the threshold for, for looking like successful training. And one thing I won't get into here in, in detail uh, is that teaching with Tamer, uh, much like teaching from demonstration, uh, can often get to good behavior much, much more quickly than, than standard reinforcement learning algorithms. So the first part of the talk here is going to be introducing our system for learning from this type of human feedback, which is uh, Tamer. You can see on the left here the typical diagram for uh, reinforcement learning agent environment interaction. Uh, the agent takes actions that changes the environment state. And then uh, that's new states communicated to the agent along with a reward. Uh, that provides feedback on uh, on that action and state. On the right is the tamer diagram, and you still have the agent on the bottom, environment, top right. There's now a human who can see what's happening uh, in the environment. The agent is acting in it, and then the human's giving delayed reward, really feedback. There's the, the reward sneaking in. Uh, delayed human feedback. And there's three main modules that the tamer agent has uh, as, it's as it's acting in the environment and receiving this human feedback. The first is the credit assigner module. So the credit assigner module exists because of a recognition that people uh, can't react instantaneously. So there's going to be some delay in their feedback. And uh, so the credit assigner roughly takes a feedback signal and spreads it around on recent state action pairs. The end result of this is a, a sample for every state action pair where the input, this is a supervised learning example, the input is a state and an action, and the output is a, a human feedback after modification from the credit assignment. The supervised learner can be really any regression algorithm, uh, and it's going to output this reward model that the action selector uses to, to, to select actions. And what that action selector does is it says, OK, here's my state. And for every possible action, uh, I'm going to query the reward model that's been learned so far. And whichever action is expected to get the, is predicted to get the highest human feedback value, that's the action I'll take. So the action selector is greedy with respect to predictions of human feedback. And I'll also just mention that the need for algorithmically driven expiration is much lower with Tamer because the human trainer can give negative feedback to actions they don't want to see, thus driving expiration because the agent then chooses new actions. It's worth noting that maybe the most salient and important feature of the Tamer framework is that it turns what seems to be a reinforcement learning problem into a supervised learning problem. And I think that's, that's part of what allows it to, to learn more quickly in many cases than, than reinforcement learning algorithms using uh, regular environmental reward. Tamer has been implemented successfully on a, a number of simulated tasks, some by us, some by uh, other groups. And uh, I won't talk about any of these in any further depth. Actually, I'll mention Atari Bowling uh, was an extension to, to deep learning. And that's, that's definitely an interesting paper to look at. And none of those tasks are robotic. And so one of the big questions is, will Tamer work on, on robots? So I had an opportunity in the summer of 2011 to be in the MIT Media Lab and implement Tamer on the robot Nexi. So here's the task environment. It's very simple. Uh, all that really matters here is the training artifact in Nexi. The training artifact is what I'm holding to my chest. It's picked up by the Vicon infrared camera system that's circling around us, the red glowing things. And um, what we draw from it is these two bird's eye view state features. The state features here, there's two of them. It's just the distance and the angle to the training artifact. Nexi here has its arms out kind of like a zombie, uh, just to make it clear which, which direction is forward. And you know, in the actual experiments, Nexi's arms are just hanging down. And the actions, there's four of them, turn left, turn right, move forward, and stay put. And the reward interface was a presenter's remote where uh, the right and left button were positive and negative uh, feedback signals, respectively. 
There is a button for toggling training on and off. That's an important feature of Tamer that I think a lot of people end up missing is that if the trainer's done training, it's a very small implementation, a line or two to be able to just turn learning off and, and have it act according to what it's learned so far. And then also there is a safety button because sometimes next to you would start to run into furniture and so on. And that would just force the stay action. The, the core things for Tamer's implementation here are that we did regression to create the, the model of human feedback by key nearest neighbors. Uh, and the time step durations and the target velocities are, are shown here as well. And I'll talk a little bit later about these time step durations. We taught five different behaviors, and this is really the second goal of the research. The first goal is to show Tamer can work on a robot. The second goal was to show that it can flexibly train different behaviors without changing the code, only changing what the trainer's doing. Um, and before I get into those five behaviors, I want to talk about the novel aspects of this being a robotic training task. So we had some early failures in training sessions that were based on lack of transparency about what the current state action pair is. So you kind of think of this as trainer agent mismatch about what the current state action pair is. And this took two different forms, the start and the end of, of actions. What happens here is you know, Nexi's acceleration is not particularly high. So if Nexi goes from staying to moving forward, say, there might be, uh, just to throw a number out there, a half second where Nexi is not, has not accelerated enough to actually know that the current action is to move forward. So Nexi looks like it's in a stay action even though it's moving forward. Um, and so the solution ended up being just to lengthen the time steps. I think something more elegant could probably be done. But basically by lengthening the time steps, then, you know, like say for moving forward, the time step was a second and a half. Maybe the first quarter or half second, it was, it was uh, technically moving forward, but not visually moving forward. But then the rest of the time step, it was. So that means a large portion of the time step, the agent's action is also the action that the trainer thinks is the action. The second one is the state of the training artifact. This Vicon system would sometimes lose it. And early on, this created some very confusing results of learning. And the solution ended up, after really digging into it and figuring out what the actual issue was, was to add an audible alarm. So whenever the Vicon system couldn't detect the artifact, and therefore the robot couldn't detect it, there was an alarm. And that allowed me as a trainer to, to quickly move the training artifact so that it would be detected and possibly turn, turn training off for just a moment. I think it's it's really worthwhile to mention here that these problems are very similar to what are called correspondence problems in imitation learning or learning from demonstration. And those are where the demonstrator's state space or observation space and their, their action space can be quite different than the agent that's going to be learning from their demonstrations and, and performing the task. There's a lot of thinking about that problem. That, that's interesting to read on. But I think it's interesting that it's very similar, and, but it, it's a little bit different that for learning from human feedback, the issue is about the trainer's mental model of what the current state action pair is. All right, so here's the first of the five behaviors, keep conversational distance. The robot's task, uh, the, the correct behavior, was to turn towards the artifact and then move towards it until the artifact is at a reasonable distance to have a conversation with. So we're kind of pretending it's a conversational partner that you're approaching. So I'll first talk about turning left. So this is a representation of the model from bird's eye view. Uh, in each case, we've got Nexty again with the arms forward. And so this is if based on the state where the training artifact could be to the left, to the right, behind, or in front of Nexty, what's the prediction of human feedback if the actions turn left? Uh, so this is the same thing if the actions turn right and so on. So for turn left, uh, what we want Nexi to do is if the if the artifact is over here, it should turn left. If the artifact is over here, uh, turn left's not a very good choice because that's turning away from the artifact. And uh, and so we actually do oh, so we actually do see that the feedback, the predicted feedback, reflects that. Uh, we see green, which is uh, bright green, is highly positive. Uh, black is near zero. And red is highly you know, is negative. Um, bright red, highly negative. 
And we see that when the artifact is to the left, that Nexi expects to get positive feedback, highly positive feedback for turning left. Um, so that's, that's good. We see the mirror image roughly for turning right, which we would want. And then for move forward, we see this bright green area for when the artifact is in front of Nexi, but not very close. And the bright green for stay is when the artifact is in front and close. So that really fits kind of if you're just going to code up the behavior uh, as I described it while talking about it up here, it really fits that pretty well. But with, with some noise and kind of jaggedness to the model, one thing that I think is worth mentioning is that, so move forward here does have a prediction of positive feedback if the artifact is far to the left over here and next he moves forward, but it's not as bright green as turn left. So it's not actually going to move forward if the artifact is over here, it's going to turn left instead. And actually the jaggedness uh, is going to be denser where there's more feedback. So you can see that it's not that dense. So there actually wasn't a lot of feedback here, um, which means that probably it mostly did turn left when it was supposed to be turning left uh, in that area. Okay, so here's a video of training. And what happened is randomly Nexi chose to stay first. And you can see the white box there indicates that. And so what I do as the trainer is, I think in the paper we call it reward painting. I take the artifact and I move it to where stay is appropriate. So you can see I'm kind of at a conversational distance here. And I'm giving a lot of positive feedback here. Um, then I'm going to move to where it's not appropriate in just a moment. So watch. Uh, I've given a lot of positive for where it should stay, where Nexi should stay. And then I move away where Nexi should not stay and give a negative. And that makes Nexi try a new action. And so I repeat the process doing a reward painting by moving the artifact to all the areas, uh, you know, it's just a representative sample of the areas where next you should turn left. So see I'm to the left and next you should turn left towards the artifact, give me a lot of positive feedback. And then once I feel that I've given a lot uh, and, you know, in a variety of situations where next you should turn left, then I move to where next you should not turn left and give a negative piece of feedback, making next you choose a new action. And so this is kind of the process. Um, to train each action. And then the rest of it is kind of testing for little, you know, the remaining errors and, and giving more feedback on those to, to sharpen what it's doing. Um, and at the end, you can, you can see the, um, the model looks like, like what we just looked at in the last slide. Here are the four other behaviors. So we have go to, which is almost the same as keep conversational distance, but next he goes all the way to the marker and says stopping the, the artifact. Um, so stopping at a conversational distance. Look away uh, is where Nexi just always looks away. You can kind of see I'm dramatically uh, acting like Nexi won't have a conversation with me. Toy Chantor means that whenever the toy is not right in front of Nexi, it kind of randomly gyrates back and forth like it's having a tantrum. And then my favorite magnetic control is uh, where if the marker is to behind Nexi, then it acts kind of like an opposite pole magnet as if it's pushing Nexi to move forward or, or turn left or right. And one interesting thing here is that uh, through human feedback, I actually end up training control interfaces. So especially with magnetic control and GoTo, uh, I'm using this artifact now to control what Nexi does uh, to, to some level. And so you could potentially use uh, this control interface then to do demonstrations and kind of this like hierarchical or, or two-step uh, manner. We never really developed that idea further, but it, it remains intriguing to me. Here's the training time. On the left, we have the actual time that Nexi's learning. The right includes time of just observing the learned behavior. And go to is a lot longer because it was the first of the five, and there, there was a learning curve as a trainer there. Here are the five predictive models of human feedback. You can pause it if you want to take a closer look. Just a review here from the talk. What I covered, other than the intro to Tamer, is a description of how the system for learning from explicit human feedback could be applied to a physically embodied robot, including some of the challenges that were observed and, and what was done to overcome them. And then the second is explicitly demonstrating the flexibility of teaching by explicit human feedback, uh, which we hadn't done previous to this, but showing that five different behaviors could be, could be taught. That ends my talk. Thank you for listening.
Hi, I'm Brad Knox. All right. So uh, thank you for watching that. And let's see. Oh, good. Brad is here. Brad, thank you so much for being with us. Um, Everybody. I really liked that talk. It's great. Can I, can I call you a professional robot trainer? That's uh, sure, sure. I don't know if I, I think I have to get paid for it to be professional. Um, you know, I think, I think if the right, uh, the right person or set of people continue to work in this, this area, then, uh, you know, then maybe it'll be deployed widely enough that there will be jobs to, to train them, be a tamer or coach or, or what have you. Nice. So um, there were a few, <laughs> a few uh, questions that you answered in, in, in Discord. Would you like to chat about either of those or should we prompt people to unmute themselves and ask either clarification or, or any kind of crazy questions? Yeah, I can, I can address the first one really quickly. Uh, so I wouldn't say there's something wrong with the phrase uh, or the terminology human reward, uh, it, but it's fallen. It, it didn't catch on. Uh, and I think human feedback is, is more common now. Um, I went to the Barbados reinforcement learning workshop back in like 2011 or 2012 that uh, is very uh, Alberta centric. And I ended up in a really long argument with Rich Sutton uh, where he, he did not like that I used the word reward uh, because it, it definitely violates, uh, you know, I, I didn't really get into this in the talk because of time, but we're essentially because it's a supervised learning problem, it's, it's, very similar to as if we were treating as reward, but then using a discount factor of zero, where the agent is only myopically trying to maximize its immediate or very short term reward. Um, and uh, so that, you know, I think normally when you think of an RL problem, you're, you're not thinking of discount factor of zero. And, uh, and so he took on bridge with, with that because that's not what reward is in the RL context. Um, but I do think it fits the way we use reward colloquially and the way it's used in a, a psychological and, and animal training sense. So I think it's debatable, but if, uh, if the term didn't catch on, I got I to gotta get with the times and, and say what other people are saying. So would you like to talk a little bit about Garrett's extension with to deep learning? And um, do you think that would still work well in the non-stationary setting? Yeah, good question. So. Let's see. So I actually, I have to confess, I've, I haven't closely read the paper, but I believe a big part of it is that they uh, pre-trained the deep network. Um, and I don't know whether it was on random, I think it's probably on random behavior. That's right. And so they had, they had a convolutional autoencoder that would look at different uh, states in Atari. And then with this autoencoder, you put the picture in, you'd narrow it down to very few, just a little bit of data, and then bring it back out to the full picture. So you basically need to learn a good compression, which means you learn a good compact representation, which can be your neural network that you can then train on. Gotcha. So they, and they just trained off of the, uh, the, the smallest layer, that, that most compressed layer. Um, yeah, so as far as non-stationarity, uh, I think there's a lot of different types of non-stationarity uh, that, that could be present. So there's non-stationarity in terms of a person changing their preferences or changing their feedback, uh, whether that's because of their preferences or maybe they're actually getting better as a teacher. So I think the there is a, a potential for there being a moving target uh, where the you know, because the feedback is changing, some of that can is ameliorated by uh the fact that we we typically use uh online learning algorithms and so and we have more recent data have more impact than than that on the the farther past uh but i think if if the scenario where you're deploying it where you really expected some non-stationarity uh, then you might want to do something a little more specific to deal with that problem uh, and off the top of my head I, I don't know what that would be but in general, we would try to, in our studies, we would get people kind of warmed up on the task first by letting them control it so that their familiarity with the task was already fairly set in before they started training. And then we would kind of have a burner episode where they would train it once to get familiar with the, the interface of, of training via positive negative buttons. 
uh, and then we would do the actual uh, the actual episodes that that mattered. Um, as far as non stationarity of I say I guess of like the the transition function or even the state space. Uh, yeah, I, don't, I haven't really thought about that. Uh, I feel like that probably would be uh, much trickier to use a pre-trained deep network for something like that, at least for the, the state space. Cool, thanks. Um, so I noticed there are a few other questions in the Discord. Do any of those, uh, would you like to comment on any of those? Uh, let me take a look at these. So yeah, I see your question about uh, training the human trainer, which I, uh, I think coincidentally I just answered. Um, I do think it's, it's worth just thinking about when you create a method like this, who the target audience or the target population is that's going to be doing training. Uh, I think in certain circumstances, you would need to expect that people are not going to have a lot of experience. But then in certain circumstances, you can expect that. Like if you were uh creating something for like a business's usage they could train someone up over hours or you know, even days or weeks to, to become really good at it uh, so i think really thinking about your deployment scenarios uh helps inform how much you're you're willing to tolerate the need to train uh let's see another one uh we need oh yeah that's a great question uh from vlad so uh, Vlad asked, if you turn off training, does the agent act greedily based on what it has, uh, what it has currently been trained, like what is, what's been trained on already, and is there any environmental reward? Uh, so in the canonical problem, there is no environmental reward. The only feedback is from the human. Um, and if you do turn off training, then there's just no further updates to the, the predictor, the predictive model of human reward. And so it will then have a fixed policy. Uh, as long as the, the training is off. Uh, we did do two papers, uh, AMOS 2010, AMOS 2012, where we looked at uh, the situation where there's human feedback, but also uh, a Markov decision processes reward signal and looked at ways to improve learning on you know, having both of those that, such that it's better than having either one alone. And we were able to show some, some really nice results on that. Uh, and we tried in the first paper eight different techniques for combining them. And what we ended up finding is that, so we, you know, we had some where say, let me think. Uh, so the first paper we had the human training and then the reward. And then the second one we did simultaneous. And we, we tried some techniques where we use the human uh, predictive model as the starting value function. So it, you know, through that, it would have a decent policy uh, but that didn't work well. Uh, and you could, if you know a fair amount about reinforcement learning, you could probably speculate why. Uh, basically, the value function is uh, for the true reward is going to look pretty different um, than, than this predictive human feedback function. Uh, but basically, any of these techniques where we change the, the core reinforcement learning update using the human feedback was not robust. And the ones, the techniques that worked really well uh, affected the exploration of the agent. So we would effectively use the predictive model of human feedback to drive behavior of the agent. And it was able to learn uh, a, you know, a Q function, a state action value function that uh, described that behavior. And, and then it could build from there. And in that technique, uh, there's actually two techniques that, that do that in different ways, but those are really effective. Uh, let's see, what else do we have? Yeah, can I just quickly ask a question to follow up sure. on that? Um, in the case, so I read that paper that you said the follow up with, the, uh, with adding to RL after, um, and maybe I'm forgetting, but when you did uh, the cases where you do combine the human trained value function with the, I guess the initialized value function of the environment, or for mm -hmm. the, for the agent, like the how you regularly would like initialize the, the Q function. Um, in that case, like the value function that it learns from the humans, are those values within a similar range to what you initialize or are they like extremely off? Like for instance, if you initialize your agent with like values of like between zero to one, but your human learned ones are from like a range of negative 100 to 100, that could 
I, I could imagine that. Yeah, I think hard. I think you're 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 getting at what what I was uh, alluding to. Maybe not clearly enough, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think that's a very good insight. It's basically, I think the issue is that um, you could come up with a lot of uh, functions that are treated like a, a a Q function, but not updated at all, could could lead to good behavior. You know, so you could have. Uh, Q values of, of one every time the action is optimal and a Q value of zero every time uh, the action is not optimal. That's not necessarily like really a Q value, but that could be what your, your, your Q function outputs and that could lead to really good behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, but then that doesn't necessarily reflect the actual Q function for that behavior. Um, and I think you get to the, you know, I think one potential issue is the scale of rewards, which you mentioned. Uh, but then I think there's just a lot of other issues that uh, a function that uh, designates good behavior is not is actually going to be very unlikely if you just randomly found some function that designates good behavior uh, the way that that tamer does it's very unlikely to also be that behavior's value function hmm. yeah and maybe um, just from my understanding as well I noticed in the presentation you mentioned that sometimes the human can give like multiple good rewards or multiple bad rewards um, or like I guess click the controller to say like this is good multiple times to like exaggerate that um so like just numerically when you're building that like value function the human using like the supervised learning um are you just like adding more i guess like is it a constant factor that's being added on there or is it um scaling like at a different rate I mean, when the human like say gives the gives a reward like clicks five times like very rapidly is that five times as good as just one click? Well, the, the, so yeah, the, the predictive model of human feedback really is just supervised learning. So after this credit assignment, and we'll just ignore credit assignment, we'll ignore that the human feedback's delayed to make it a, a simpler uh, problem. Uh, basically, say for the Tetris example, you have these features that are drawn that describe that piece placement. And that's the input for a supervised learning sample. And, uh, and the label is going to be the sum of these button presses, you know, so again, like even if you do positive, positive, negative, then it's just the sum of those. So you end okay. up with a positive one. Um, okay. And the, the reason for allowing that, uh, it's been a while, but I, I can think of one, maybe two, is that uh, you might have some behavior that you approve of somewhat, but it's not the best behavior. And you've already labeled it with like a plus one because you want to encourage it. And then uh, for whatever reason, the agent tries an even better behavior. And so you want to have some room to be able to, to label that as the actual best behavior. Uh, and then also there's generalization. That's one thing I, I didn't really get into, but I think you can typically assume that for supervised learning, we're doing generalization. And so uh, if speaking, you know, I think again, a little hand wave is a little bit of our simplification, but if you have a strong, like a higher label for the regression, it's going to, I think, generalize further in most cases. Uh, so if, if something's really good, in some cases, you're going to want your feedback, your approval to generalize more uh, than if it's just somewhat good. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I'm having trouble reading the questions and answering them at the same time. So if any, if Matt, if you, if any jump out to you is worth, uh, I'm just kind of reading whatever comes to my eye and, and answering it. So yeah. if, if there's specific ones you think I should answer, please. Well, so I think, I think. Um, I think the most significant one, there's a few that I, I definitely want to talk about in the next class, but I'm actually wondering, Brad, what you would prefer to do, because I know you recorded this other video on your most current work. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think it'd be good to, good to jump into that. And then we can uh, either have further questions on, on Tamer or on the newer work. Okay. That so good? yeah, that sounds good to me. I'm going to jump back into this other video and then Again, people can ask questions in Discord, and anything we don't get to today with Brad, we can always uh, follow up him, with him on email, and then I'll talk about it in another class. So please do keep taking notes and asking questions in Discord. I'm Brad Knox, and I'm going to talk about the empathic framework for task learning from implicit human feedback. Before I jump in, I want to mention this is work done in collaboration between Bosch and UT Austin. I and my, uh, my partner, Alessandro Aliebi, are establishing a research group located inside the University of Texas for Bosch 
uh, focused on autonomous driving and specifically reinforcement learning and imitation learning for autonomous driving. This work was done jointly with Yuchen Kui, Chiping Zhang, Scott Nikum, and Peter Stone. Yuchen and Chiping are the joint first authors for this work. First, I'd like to jump into what we mean by implicit human feedback. Illustrate. Imagine that he's interviewing the woman in the foreground uh, for a potential job. As she's doing the interview, she is probably watching the man's facial reactions, body pose, all sorts of nonverbal behavior to try to understand how she's doing and how she might modify her behavior in the interview to be more effective. This is something that we do very naturally. And the information she's pulling from, we exhibit very naturally and very frequently, and, but you know, often in, in hard to interpret ways. This, this information is what we're calling implicit human feedback, where uh, to define a little bit more, what I mean is uh, feedback that is not intended to uh, teach or to influence behavior, but nonetheless contains information about how another agent is performing a task. The big appeal to me of implicit human feedback is that although it can be difficult to interpret, it is a, a source of information that we are freely giving out already. And so this is a, a, a type of feedback that can be used without any additional cost on, on people, not without asking anything of them. You might have more costs in terms of adding a sensor you know, or more computation, that kind of thing, but no demands on humans, uh, human attention or time. It's really kind of taking information that's just kind of out there and being put out there and currently not being harnessed and using that to understand what people want and potentially adapt autonomous systems behaviors to do what they want. Let's kind of put this in our, our own framing. Who among us has not scowled at a robot vacuum as it bumps into your foot or gets stuck uh, under a couch or raised our eyebrows at our cruise control or shared choice words with automatic doors that aren't, aren't acting the way we think they should, or reacted to the decisions that a driver has made. To ground this out in a specific application, uh, we're focused on autonomous driving in, in our group, um, although we are able to do this, this type of more fundamental research that uh, isn't only applicable to autonomous driving. Imagine you have an autonomous vehicle and it needs to stop at a crosswalk. You've already created an algorithm that can do that safely, so that the safety is not in question. But it could slow down at different rates, and the way it slows down, the deceleration profile likely is going to affect the experience of the riders and of pedestrians nearby. And so you could potentially use the reactions of these people, pedestrians or riders, to adapt the deceleration profile to create better experiences. Before I get into our framing of the problem, uh, more specifically in our solution, uh, I want to talk about some related work. First, uh, there's work by Arakawa et al., where they have an algorithm they call DQN Tamer, which is a, a, a mix of the reinforcement learning algorithm, DQN, and Tamer, which I developed in my dissertation, where they use an out-of-the-box emotion classifier uh, that classifies people's emotions based on a camera feed on their face. And though I think there's seven emotions that are possibly output, they just classify these emotions as positive, negative, or neutral, and map those to, they have a hand-coded mapping to, to tamer feedback, uh, which I believe would be a, a plus one, a zero, or a negative one. Uh, there's work by Vivek Varia. I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. He actually did this work during his master's thesis at University of Alberta, and um, he did it under Rich Sutton and Patrick Polarski. And he did work where uh, they use implicit human feedback uh, via learning a value function where that, that the facial expressions are used as input, um, and I believe as, as part of the, the state. So it's, it's kind of like additional state information for the value function. Guangliang Li and collaborators uh, do something somewhat similar where they learn a model that predicts a user's tamer feedback from their facial expressions. And then these, they use these predictions of tamer feedback to augment the actual manual feedback to get, to get a richer uh, set of feedback and learn more quickly. I want to note that all of the cases above involve explicit teaching, training, and or at testing time. And those that do learn a reaction mapping, the, the last two, use both states and actions as input, uh, which is going to limit how well they can transfer their learn model to new task domains that have different state spaces and action spaces. 
I'm going to just briefly mention there's also work in brain computer interaction that could be considered learning from implicit human feedback. Somewhat reiterating here, our approach is distinct in three different ways. One, we do not require explicit teaching or manual labeling by users. We, in our reaction mapping, we only use human reactions as input, which makes it so the reaction mapping potentially can be used in, in any task. Um, I say potentially, there's, you know, there's still some important instantiation details for that to be true. And the last one is we uh, let the data decide what task statistics to map human reactions to. So in the, the related work, some uh, one mapped to value, to state value, I believe. Uh, two of them mapped to tamer type feedback. And there's a lot of different things you could try to map to. And so we uh, take a more agnostic approach. Uh, I will say that uh, our, the framework we're going to propose, the empathic framework, delivers on all three of these, but the instantiation that I'm going to describe only really delivers on the first two. We're going to end up focusing on predicting reward in the instantiation, but the framework is, is general. Before I get into our solution, I'll talk a little bit about the, the problem. We call this problem the, the life problem, learning from implicit human feedback. And you could describe the problem like this. Uh, the problem is answering the question of how can an agent maximize return under a human's hidden reward function using information derived from the human's reactions to that agent's behavior. So you put this in a little bit different language. Uh, an agent is performing a task. The human has some you know, psychological, you know, in their brain, not observable uh, reward function that we assume exists. It cannot be observed, uh, but it has some influence over their reactions. And so we want to be able to use those reactions to uh, change the agent's behavior um, so that it's going to uh, have a higher accumulation of reward according to this hidden reward function. Uh, this tuple describes a specific life problem. Uh, I'll, I'll be brief and unfortunately I'll just make the assumption that you already know about uh, market decision processes. So the, the three items in the middle are the only ones that differ from an MDP. So notice there's no regular reward function. There's this hidden reward function inside the human that can't be observed. Uh, there's uh, the X superscript H. That's a set of possible observations of the human. Uh, so for instance, if there's a camera feed on a human's face, this could be the, you know, the space of possible pixel values. And then there's uh, this, this psi, which is uh, basically it, it says, given what the agent has done and the human's uh, reward function, what's the probability that they'll react in one way or another. Um, and so these all together describe the, the life problem. And, and I won't come back fully to this, uh, this, this formulation, uh, but the approach we take in a way is learning the, the reverse of this, this psi. Um, you know, I'm, I'm saying that fairly loosely, but psi goes from the trajectory in the human's reward function to the x super superscript h, and instead we're going to go from the trajectory in x superscript h to uh, you know, in, you know, specific probabilities over the instances of the human's reward. Um, you know, and it can be other task statistics as well, but in our instantiation it will be human reward. That's the life problem. Our approach to the life problem we call the empathic framework. It has two stages. The first stage in, involves learning a mapping, uh, a reaction mapping go that goes from these human reactions to what we call task statistics. I'll say more about that in a second. The second is using that reaction mapping and people's reactions to understand a task, to learn about a task. I'll go into this a little bit more detail here. All right, so uh, in stage one, where we're learning the reaction mapping. You've got the agent and the environment interacting uh, in the, the typical sense for sequential decision-making task. Uh, the human is observing and reacting uh, to what they're observing. Um, again, they are not controlling. They're not explicitly teaching. Um, and importantly, only in stage one, there's a full task specification. So we do know the reward function uh, for this task. And we incentivize the human to be aligned with that reward function. So we want this, this hypothesized or kind of assumed internal human reward function to be as close of a match to the reward function in our task specification. And the way we end up doing that is we pay subjects uh, where the return of an agent that they're observing is, uh, I believe, proportional to their, their payout for being subjects. 
Um, so we got that task specification. And as the trajectory is being created, uh, various task statistics can be computed. So reward doesn't really need to, be, need to be computed, but that's the task statistic. You could compute the state values, the state action values, advantage, uh, zero or one for whether the action was optimal or not for that given state. And so that gives you a lot of different possible task statistics to, to store here. And uh, at the same time, these reactions are going through feature extraction. And so we end up with this data set that's a supervised learning data set uh, where the features that come out of the reactions are the inputs and the task statistics are possible outputs. And you can do supervised learning on a bunch of different task statistics and see in various ways which ones are being modeled more effectively than others. The end result of stage one is this reaction mapping, the mapping of reaction features to task statistics. And then here's stage two. You no longer have a task specification. Um, but uh, a lot of things are similar. So you'd still have the agent environment interaction, a human observing and reacting. And those reactions are getting, uh, you know, features are being extracted from the reactions. And, but now, uh, at least in the kind of canonical version, the agent doesn't have any other form of feedback besides what's coming from the human reactions. And so the output of this reaction mapping might be reward or probability distributions over reward. It could be uh, something related to advantage or any of these other task statistics. And really, I, I might just say advantage there as shorthand, but in every case, I think we should be outputting probability distributions because of the noisiness and the uncertainty of this, this sort of feedback. Um, so with these task statistics that are being generated from the human reactions, we, in various ways, can try to assemble an understanding of the task or the behavior that's, that's, being, that's, that's been reacted to. And from that, we could change the, the agent's behavior, uh, hopefully improving the return that the agent is getting according to this, this hidden human uh, reward function. And we, you know, reiterating, we call it empathic, which stands for evaluative mapping for affective task learning via human implicit cues. Now I'm going to talk about, uh, for most of the rest of the talk, how we instantiate empathic. And first, I'm going to talk about getting the data set to do the supervised learning. So we wanted to craft an observation session to gather rich, authentic data. Now here we're talking about uh, this portion of the, the schematic of stage one for empathic. And we're really trying to get that, that, the, the core data before computing task statistics and doing feature extraction. OK, so here's what we created. We created a domain called RoboTaxi. We told people to. Uh, pick an autonomous vehicle to buy. And so they pick this skin. It doesn't affect the behavior. And then we tell them, I'm going to pause it here, sit back and enjoy being a robo-taxi tycoon. Your robo-taxi is going to go around town and pick up passengers and make you money with their fares. And you don't have to do anything. Um, but then what actually happens, I'll let it play again, is we have a fixed policy that at least in a slight oversimplification, is uniformly randomly choosing uh, among the different action types. So it's, so it's quite bad. And, and the video you're seeing is actually even worse than, than normal, which is just, just bad luck. Um, and so we're getting a kind of a rich set of different reactions. They're not just seeing, we're not just seeing people react to good behavior, but to, to very bad behavior. So the negative $5 comes when they hit a, a parked car. Uh, or when their autonomous vehicle does, negative one dollar for hitting a roadblock, and they get six dollars for picking up a passenger. So we get this the, this reaction data set. Here are some samples of the reactions, and you can see some people are reacting quite a lot. Some people are almost, you know almost imperceptibly reacting, and I want to draw your attention to the man in the red at the top. If you look at him, it's really hard to tell whether he's smiling because he's actually happy, or if he's frustrated, uh, I would guess frustrated. Uh, and in fact, I think we saw more frustrated smiles than, than you know, smiles in a positive context. You know, this is not an extremely easy problem for people or machines. And, and so I think this is uh, one rough illustration of, of uh, how it can be tricky, and, and therefore it could be good to have data. Um, and the, the right thing to learn for this person's reaction might be 
Uh, not that something good or bad happened, but that there's you know close to a uniform probability over good or bad things happening. With this data set, we took a while to do human exploration of the data, and we did it in a few different ways. Uh, the first is we did something that we called the human proxy experiment, where the six co-authors, we all acted as if we were the algorithm. And the reason for doing this was to get very familiar with the data set and the problem we were posing for the algorithm, and also just to show that this was doable at all. And so what we did is, you can see up at the top here, uh, these are four frames of the game. And then on the bottom are four frames, but now the objects have been randomly anonymized. So each object type uh, was, was assigned one of three colors, and the agent's now just a circle. And so we just watched this bottom one, and we watched the person's reactions, and our job is to try to say, after watching a portion of the episode, uh, whether you know, which, which of these colors correspond to which object type. And more specifically, we end up ranking them. So you can see these objects. I'm going to use the objects and reward values somewhat interchangeably in this talk um, because there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. Um, but we end up ranking the, the three colors by our inference of their reward values. So I'll let you actually take a try here. The correct answer is that the red was the very good, the positive six, uh, picking up a passenger. The blue was very bad, which is running into the parked car, getting a negative five. And yellow was the mildly bad, which is a negative one for hitting a roadblock. Uh, this person, I would say, was on the easier side uh, for interpretation. And people, some people are almost unreactive. So the, you know, the difficulty of this problem is often going to be specific to the person who is being observed. Here are the results of the human proxy experiment. You can see the Kindle's Tau scores for all six uh, authors here. I won't say anything about the, the ordering. Uh, but the way to interpret these is, so Kindle's Tau uh, takes a ranking, so this is our rankings of the three objects by their reward values, uh, and compares it to another ranking. In this case, it's going to be the ground truth of their actual uh, your ranking by reward values. And so with Kindle's Tau, a one is a perfect score, always getting the ranking right. And a zero means you did the same as uh, a random ordering, uh, or at least the expectation of a random ordering. And negative one is as bad as possible. You got to reverse every time at the right order. And you can see we're generally above zero. And one author at the top actually got uh, statistical significance, even with multiple testing adjustments. Um, and so the big takeaway here is not that we're better than random uh, or anything about our average performance, but rather that one author was able to do better than random. And so that indicates that the information is there in the people's reactions to, to infer information about the task. This gave us a lot of courage in the kind of the troughs of sorrow in the middle where we spent really like two or three months trying to get the, the supervised learning to, to really be effective, which we did eventually, and I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. We also, the first two authors, uh, did annotations of the data of these, these nine different types of annotations. You can pause and take a close look if you want. Uh, these charts, I'll just quickly explain what they are. The, the tall vertical black line is the onset of whatever reaction is being annotated. So for instance, the onset of an eyebrow frown. And the red, yellow, and blue are the three different types of uh, object types that were interacted with at different times around the onset of that reaction. So if you look at uh, eyebrow frown, uh, you end up, you can see that uh, around one second before, maybe two seconds before uh, an eyebrow frown, it's more frequent that you see uh, one of the two negative events happening than the green happening. So you can kind of look at these and, and get a sense of what each of them tell us about the relationship of people's reactions and these events that have different reward values. We found these useful, again, for really familiarizing ourselves with the data and choosing which direction to go in our, our model search. 
Now I'm going to talk about uh, how we actually do the supervised learning and then use the, the reaction mapping. Uh, but first, because that gets a little complex, I'm going to give an overview. So here's the two stages again. Uh, we've got the, the task visualization and these task statistics, in this case it's reward, and the subject reactions. We create a classifier. Uh, it says RL stat, it's just a task statistic classifier. And basically that goes from the reaction mappings to probability distributions uh, over the reward classes or whatever the task statistic is. And with this classifier, which is the trained reaction mapping, we can then apply it in uh, an anonymized version of the task. Um, so now we're getting, this isn't specific to the empathic framework, but this is specific to our instantiation. So from here, from this slide on forward, be careful that we're talking about an instantiation. The empathic framework is much more general than, than what I'm talking about now. But so with the, these reactions to this anonymized version of the task, the reaction mapping is going to output a likelihood of each of these events having happened and having created those reactions. And we can do various things with that, which, which I'll explain. I'm going to talk now about stage one, which is learning that reaction mapping. And first, I'm going to talk about the feature extraction to create the supervised learning samples. This is a little complicated, uh, but uh, just bear with me here. So here's, a, here's the game, a trajectory over time. You can see a representation of what's happening in the game where there's no interaction with an object, a passenger's picked up, no interaction, no interaction, crashing into a car, and so on. We are interested in making a supervised learning sample in this illustration for this one time step, which is crashing into a car. Concurrently, there are these image frames of the person, and note the frames per second are, are quite different, and they're beyond that, they're, they're asynchronous. From these frames, we do feature extraction for every image frame, and I'll talk about how we do that in a moment. And then we reduce the number of frames by aggregating them. So we go from 30 FPS to 6 FPS uh, by max pooling. Uh, so you know, generally about five frames uh, will go into making one aggregated frame that's of the same vector size. Down here, uh, this is kind of the same process, but from a different perspective. So here's all the, the image frames. To create this feature vector, we use OpenFace 2.0. It outputs a number of things, but the, the outputs we use are the facial action units, which are related to uh, a system that I believe Paul Ekman created, where it's trying, if I, if I understand correctly, it's trying to assess how constricted various facial muscles are. This is really good information, but uh, I've heard it characterized as, as very noisy as well when it comes from open face, to what we know. Uh, and then also it has head pose information. And we feed that into a Fourier transform uh, with the idea that we want to capture whether a person is shaking their head up and down or left and right and you know, possibly with certain speed. And so we end up with these, these different uh, types of features, one around the facial action units, these, these muscles, uh, and then one around the, the head motion. And uh, if we're interested in a specific, you know, we're, we're trying to make uh, the input, the features for the supervised learning example, we already know the reward class, uh, which is it's the negative six or negative five one. Um, and we have a, a predefined time window that we're going to pull uh, reaction based features from. And all of those are going to, they're represented down here. So this is for one supervised learning example. This is the set of aggregated frames in the window. And they're going to be flattened into two big vectors. And there's an encoding. And then they're con concatenated. And that's going to make the input for supervised learning. So now that we have these supervised learning samples, uh, I'll talk about the modeling. And the, so the missing part here in the diagram is the, that input, the, the features are given to a uh, multi-layer perceptron, and that is tasked with minimizing cross-entropy for reward classification. Uh, we actually ended up having it uh, reduce entropy of both binary and ternary classification. Uh, I can talk about that in, in questions um, about why we think that was helpful. And then we also had the auxiliary, an auxiliary task where it was trying to reduce mean squared error uh, related to predicting uh, characteristics of the, the annotations. I believe that was just predicting for zero or one whether a certain rea annotated reaction was happening or not at any time. 
the auxiliary tests appeared to be really helpful, and so it's kind of ingrained in our in what we did. But then we actually tested without it and found some really good results. So we don't necessarily have to have uh, annotated data to to do what we we end up showing that we do. This is how we split up the the data for training and testing and also validation, and, and we have a holdout set. Um, again, I can get into detail in the questions, but I'll just say uh, each subject had three episodes they observed, and one episode was pulled away into a holdout, like hidden in a holdout set, and the rest was split into training, testing, validation, and we would do a different split for each subject, um, and you can see this here. This is, this is the split for subject K. Here are our results uh, after a lot of it, you know, experimentation, trying to improve the validation loss, but not the holdout set loss. We save that for, for later. The main takeaway here is the dotted lines. So the gray dotted line is the cross entropy loss for the, the model's ability to, to predict these reward values uh, if the model always predicted the exact same probability distribution and then that distribution was, was the best fixed distribution possible, which is the training, the distribution of the labels and the training distribution. I should mention, I don't think I mentioned before, we're only predicting the three uh, reward, non-zero reward classes. Uh, so we're predicting the reward that comes when an object is interacted with. We're not including data for when, uh, when no object was interacted with. Now, if you look at the red dotted line, that represents the average validation loss of the models that are created for each individual subject, uh, but then averages together. And you can see that it's better than this baseline of the label distribution. Uh, so the reactions do seem to be helping, but it's it's hard to say whether it's helping enough to to say that we're confident that it's just not better due to randomness. From a certain perspective, this improvement from 1.1-ish to 1.05-ish or 1.06 really doesn't seem like a lot, but it actually fits pretty well with this problem of implicit human feedback where the feedback itself is very noisy. So you don't want a model that's going to be extremely confident always. And so you're going to end up with a lot of uh, you know, high cross entropy loss much of the time. And in fact, that label distribution level of cross entropy loss really is kind of the safe thing. So if, if the reactions are not informative, then the output should be somewhat close to that, that label distribution, uh, which we did choose to be close to, close to uniform. I think what matters more is this next analysis where we want to use this mapping to infer what the actual reward function is over many different uh, interactions within events. This gets us to stage two, where we have a, a trained reaction mapping, and now we're going to deploy it offline in the RoboTaxi training test. So we're, we're going to have three different versions of stage two. This one we're using already collected data of people reacting to the same data set that we already talked about. So here's a representation of what we're getting out of the reaction mapping. Over time, there's these different events where the agent's interacting with these anonymized objects. And from the reactions and the reaction mapping, we get a probability distribution over what that actual event was. That happens for many different events. Three are shown here, but it would be as many times as, it, as the agent interacts with one of these objects. We're going to look at just one of these events to see how we use it to update our belief over different reward mappings. From this event and the output uh, here, we can think about uh, so, so we've got these six possible reward mappings. Uh, just to kind of review here, there's, these are the three anonymized uh, object types, and those could map one to one to the three real object types in six different ways. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six different mappings. And from this output here, you can get a likelihood of each of the mappings, an unnormalized likelihood of each of these mappings. And so the way this works is uh, we know the events, the pink event, so we look down the pink column, and for this mapping, if it's, if it's that mapping, then this event was the, the car crash. And so we look uh, for the probability that corresponds to the car crash, and that's the likelihood, the unnormalized likelihood of this mapping. And we do it and so on. So all the dark ones are the, the actual likelihoods of, of, of those mappings unnormalized. Using that over many different events, we assume they're, they're independent, and we can just multiply. So for this mapping, we just keep multiplying. We get the product of, of the likelihoods over all the events. And so we get this likelihood of that mapping over the whole trajectory. And we have six of those likelihoods, one for each mapping. We normalize that. And 
from that, we actually have likelihoods of each of the reward mappings from that trajectory. And we can also do this at any stopping point. So we could have, we could just be 10 seconds into a trajectory and have a few events and also pull out the, the current likelihood uh, for that. So we did exactly that for, again, this is for offline data. So this is actually from the holdout set, the episodes that are in the holdout set. Um, and again, we're looking at Kindle's tau value, where one means a, a perfect ranking of, of the anonymized objects by their reward values. And negative one is getting them totally backwards, zero is random. Uh, orange is our reaction mapping with the auxiliary task based on annotations, and then yellow is without it. And you can see that generally it's above zero, which is good. You also can see here the human proxy average, which I don't want to put a lot of weight on. But if you look at it fairly closely, and if, you, if I share the numbers, uh, we do better than the average co-author. We are not trying to say in any way that that's an, an important thing or that the co-authors represent any group of people in general. But uh, we thought it was interesting to see that there, there seems to be some correlation between how difficult one subject's episode is for our model and how difficult it is for humans, uh, but not, you know, not a perfect correlation. There's more correlation seemingly between the two models. Also, while I really am not asserting this in any way meaningfully, I still take some pride that the algorithm ends up doing better than, than us humans. The really important thing, though, here is at the bottom. So statistical testing shows that our model, both versions, the yellow and orange, with or without the auxiliary task, do better than a random guess at the ranking. So that's the big takeaway, is that we were able to use the model to harness these reactions to understand the task better than we could without the reactions. We did a second stage two version where we do online learning. So this is the same thing, except the data is coming from a live person who's sitting there watching the agent while the agent is using the information from the reactions to adapt its behavior. Here's a video uh, where one of the co-authors is, is illustrating how this works uh, in our actual experiments. Co-authors are not included. Uh, but what you can see here, I'll stop for a second. So you can see here, uh, this is with about two seconds delay, what the inference is of the probabilities of each of these objects being the object that was actually interacted with. And then this here is the belief over reward mappings. And the two green ones are the ones, this one's the correct one, I believe. But this one's the one that's incorrect, but it still puts passengers as the best thing to get. Uh, so the two green ones are the ones where a greedy agent would be acting optimally. So I'll let it go a little bit further. But you can see already the likelihood for the two green ones are the highest. I think they'll go down a little bit again, uh, but end up still the highest. And you can see here that uh, Yu Chen, our collaborator, is not wildly reacting, but she is on the, I think, on the easier to interpret uh, side of reaction. But it, it can do fairly well with even much, much subtler reactions, as long as there are some reactions. If you're interested, you can go back and look at this. I think it's really kind of fun to look at how good it is. And sometimes it's really wrong. Um, it'll pick up a passenger, and the probability of it having been a passenger is, is the lowest of the three. But this is built in a way where really we're interested in the aggregated understanding of the task. And it's OK for it to be somewhat wrong in any one instance. So that really reflects, like, we, we built something that fits the noisiness of this kind of uh, feedback. Here are results with 10 subjects. In the plot, you see return over time. Uh, so we only did 100 time steps for, for this. Uh, nine out of 10 subjects end up with higher than the expectation for a random policy, a uh, higher return. Seven out of the 10 subjects, when the session was stopped, their maximum likelihood reward mapping correctly considers the passenger pickup to be the best. The first thing, the nine out of 10, is statistically significant. I think these are really positive results, but they're, I think they're actually pessimistic results. Because of the pandemic and a little bit of rushing, we didn't do everything that actually, I think, helps us that we had done with the data set I talked about before. So we didn't actually pay subjects for this part. And so I don't think their internal reward, uh, you know, if we assume that's a thing, uh, is aligned as well as it could have been with the reward that this re reaction mapping was, was trained on. Another thing is that the expiration of the agent was probably lower than it should have been. So it may not have been gathering as much information as it could have been on how good the 
the objects are that it didn't consider to be the best at that moment. The third version of deploying of stage two of deploying the reaction mapping that we learned uh, is putting in a new domain. Uh, so we take the reaction mapping that's learned in RoboTaxi and we apply it in this robotic manipulation task. So just to be clear, we do not train a reaction mapping for this task. The reaction mapping is taken from RoboTaxi, uh, but we apply it to people observing this task. The way this task is set up, the robot uh, executes one of eight pre-computed trajectories where the task itself is to put cans in the recycling bin and nothing else. And an episode is pretty short. It ends either with something going in the box, which results in a positive one or a negative one reward, whether it should have been there or not, or it ends with nothing ever going in the box. So that's a zero. So there's three possible returns, negative one, zero, or positive one for an episode. Here's another view from the subject's perspective. And I'll let you see a video uh, while I explain what we do here. Uh, so for reasons I, I, I won't get into for time, we end up, instead of using the reaction mapping's output as a probability, we call it a positivity score. And the way we get this positivity score is when the reaction mapping outputs the probabilities of the three reward classes from RoboTaxi, the probability of the positive one, of picking up the passenger, uh, is going to be you know, its probability. So it's between zero and one. And we just take that as a positivity score. And then over the whole trajectory of an episode, uh, we get the average positivity score. And we're able to rank episodes by their positivity scores that, that come from these reaction mappings. Then we can co compare those rankings to the actual rankings by their return. Here on the right, you can see, uh, oh, actually, one other thing is uh, there's eight trajectories, but each subject only saw seven uh, trajectories. Here on the right, I think these are all the subjects that had usable data. And this is their Kindle's Tau score for the ranking that their reaction mapping created. So you can see everybody did better than, than the expectation for random ranking and some, you know, we're getting somewhat close to, to one. Another way that we look at this is we, for the eight type of episodes, the eight different trajectories, we take the average positivity score across all subjects and we rank by that. So we just end up with one single ranking of these, these eight trajectories. And you can see it here. Uh, it's quite good. The only thing that, and, and the color indicates the, the return. Uh, the only thing that's out of place is the red bottle, and it's only out of place by, by two spots. And by Kindle's Tau independence test, this is a, uh, a significant result. So we had three really nice results in stage two, testing our reaction mapping, one with offline data in Robot, RoboTaxi, so same, the same task that we trained in, one with online policy improvement based on the, the reactions in RoboTaxi, and then one, again, offline, uh, but in a new task where it's actually a physically present robot doing uh, manipulations of objects. To close out the talk, I want to mention three ways that we're simplifying the problem for now. One is this private experimental setting uh, reduces subjects' distractions. In real scenario, realistic scenarios, I think it's very common that people are going to have several things competing for their attention. And it might even be that the agent is not their intended attention target. It might be that they're reading a book and their robot vacuum is cleaning and they only really pay attention when the robot vacuum annoys them or something like that. And so that brings up this challenge of knowing when a person exhibits some reaction, knowing what they're reacting to, or at least being able to incorporate that, whether you know fully what they're reacting to, incorporate that into the model. Another one is we avoided the question of how people's behavior will change if they know they're influencing the system. I think there's this, this tricky thing where we want to be creating a solution for implicit human feedback, but if a human knows they can affect the behavior of the agent by their reactions, in many cases, I think we can confidently say in many cases, that's going to change their behavior in some way. And my hope is that it will change their behavior in a small enough way that it's not going to break the system, or rather, you know, maybe the, then it'll just have to be further iterations on the design of the reaction mapping. Uh, another one is that we chose friendly tasks, both the robo taxi task and the human or the uh, the robot manipulation task, uh, in two different respects. One, the task for, for the reaction mapping itself involves three discrete reward classes rather than regression over all possible reward values um, or other stat task statistic values. And then also, both tasks were what I would argue were pseudo bandit tasks in the sense that the state of the task didn't have a lot of impact 
on the return beyond the, the near-term reward. A lot of reinforcement learning tasks involve trying to improve the state without necessarily getting any near-term reward. Neither of these tasks have that characteristic. We want to, hopefully within a few more papers, get this technique, this framework and methodology for instantiating empathic to where it could actually go into products and services. And we have identified five key areas that we need to improve things and focus on. So one, we need more data. Uh, 20 subjects is just not a lot of data you know, in the deep learning era. We, we were able to leverage the OpenFace uh, 2.0 open source uh, toolkit. Uh, and that was critically helpful, but I think we can do a lot better with more data. Uh, we're developing a, a Mechanical Turk platform for, for gathering it. We also want to predict more types of task statistics. We focus mostly on reward. We did a little bit of work looking at other task statistics, but I think reward is going to have a limit of how, how effective it can be and what kinds of tasks it can be effective. Another one is we want a wider range of tasks. So we're, the, the next round, we're, we're picking three tasks that we think are somewhat representative of different types of reinforcement learning tasks. I think that's going to force us to really sharpen the technique. And if you remember our usage of the reaction mapping in the robot task, I think I used the word hack. And we did show, I think very legitimately, that the reaction mapping contained information about how good behavior was. But the specific way we used the reaction mapping was inelegant. And really, we should be able to come up with one, I think, one way of creating reaction mapping where it's applied the same way in every task. The second to last direction here is to extend this to scenarios where people are attending to various different tasks, maybe primarily to one other task, but where distraction and competing attention targets are there. And the last one is just looking at more reaction modalities. I think that's a pretty straightforward, obvious one, looking at gaze, gestures, things like that. With that, I'll end my talk. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Brad Knott. Awesome. Well, thank you, Brad, again, for uh, bringing us this uh, late breaking news story. Uh, it's not not even accepted yet, but we're hearing about cutting edge research. Um, so I, I want to be uh, respect, uh, respect your time. And we've only got a few minutes left. Are there any things, uh, any questions in the chat you'd like to directly address? Or is there anything else you'd like to, to say? Uh, if you're talking, I can't hear you. How's that? Hey, now I can. All right. I double muted myself on the mic and on Zoom. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I'm reading, I'm reading uh, Scott's, Scott's comment that just came up uh, where he said that uh, he predicts that people would simplify or exaggerate their reactions in this setting uh, compared to interaction with other people. Uh, I, I think that's a, I think it's a really good point. Um, so I think that's one reason why it's important to try to gather the data for training in as, uh, I guess you could say authentic of a scenario as possible. You know, so we could gather the data in human to human interaction, uh, but you know, that might not actually reflect how they react when they're, they're watching an agent. Um, I do find it very encouraging that the reaction mapping trained in RoboTaxi uh, contained useful information when applied with a physical robot doing a, a fairly different task. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that's a challenge from an experimental design perspective and a data gathering perspective of, of trying to have your training data uh, reflect the deployment scenario. Okay, so uh, I deep, think- Oh, go ahead. Are we out of time? Uh, pretty much. Um, so what I'm, I'm going to ask uh, everyone who's, who's taken the class for credit, could you please put at least one question into the chat if you haven't already? And then I will ping Brad if he has time to respond to some of them, great. But then we can discuss them on Thursday. Uh, because I, I would like to, to discuss this more because I think it's a really interesting piece of work. What I would like to say is if, if Brad has a few minutes after this, uh, we could have a, a short informal discussion if anyone had any any more questions. Um, so, for instance, we're yeah, talking. Yeah, a few minutes. Ta perfect, because we're talking with someone who did a postdoc, um, started has a, did a startup, uh, is now working for an awesome company. So, I I thought you some people here might want to briefly prick, pick his brain uh, since we've got him here. All right. So with that, I will stop streaming.
And thank you again, Brad.